Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Peggy Green. Peggy Green is a mother, grief coach, and speaker overcoming odds of surviving losing two children, one in an accident and the other by suicide. Her mission is to make an impact and help others grieving the loss of a child, especially to those by suicide. Her Amazon best-selling book, Life After Child Loss, The Mother's Survival Guide to Cope and Find Joy, and Thursday Thoughts helps hundreds in their grief journey. Her passion is to share the four corners Stones of Healing program, which is how she personally overcame her losses. She offers realistic and applicable practices that helps others to heal. If you've lost a child, if you know of anyone who's lost a child, this is an episode you're going to gain so much value from. I'm speaking with Peggy Green, known as the grief specialist, and she's called that for a good reason. Peggy lost two children. She's going to share how she moved through it and she's going to share tools and strategies so if you're going through this type of trauma, you can move through it too. Here we go. Okay, everybody, I have Peggy Green with us today. And yes, it's from Betrayal to Breakthrough. This is a different type of betrayal we're talking about today. And maybe you consider it a betrayal. Maybe you don't. Um, But I'm going to leave that to you. Peggy is going to be speaking about what some of you may think is the the unthinkable. And that's that's grief. And it's the type of grief when you lose a child. And uh, not only has Peggy lost one child, she's lost two. So we're, I have a feeling we're going to learn so much from this brave and wonderful woman. So welcome, Peggy. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So can you share some of your story with us? Yes, I would, I would love to. So, you know, and I put this in a story format so that people can really understand where I'm coming from. So think about this is that I was driving home on a Friday afternoon in rush hour traffic, a couple weeks away from Christmas, and I was lost in thought. You know, I was looking at the, you know, houses with the decorations and thinking about the things I needed to do for the holiday, the shopping, and you know, all those traditional things. And what am I get to spend with my kids? And my thoughts were broken into when my phone rang. It was my daughter who was calling, and she frequently calls me when I'm driving. But this time, instead of her usual, hello, mama, she was saying something to somebody else in the background and said, well, he hasn't been feeling well lately. I immediately knew she was talking about her brother, my son, because they worked in car dealerships next to each other. And they were frequently found in each other's showrooms, either taking a break or helping each other, but they were frequently found together. So it wasn't unusual for her to be speaking about him. But when I called out to her and go, Brittany, 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 she didn't answer. So I hung up the phone and called her back. And when she answered, it was a hello, but it was also lost in sobs and tears. And she said, Mama, I don't know how to tell you this. This is the hardest thing I'm ever going to tell you is that Connor is dead. Connor killed himself. Oh, and my God, I had pulled off on the side of the highway by now and I was slamming my hands against that steering wheel and cried out to God and said, no, how can this happen? Because this took me to a flashback of 28 years before when my nine month old daughter passed away. And I couldn't imagine this was surreal. It was horrible not to lose but one but to have a second child now be gone. So all I knew is that I needed, I needed to get back to where my kids were and where my son took his last breath. So I turned that car around and headed back to where my son took his last breath. So having lost two children, has now propelled me into what I'm doing now. So for the first year, I essentially blogged on Facebook, sharing my journey, my loss, my heartache, but then also sharing the progress that I was making. 
And with my friends and family and followers, they were saying, wow, this is great. This is helping me. You need to write a book. So I did write a book. That was amazing because I knew what I had used to get me through my first loss also helped me through my second. But then in between all that and those 28 years, I lost other family members, both parents, my sister, friends, family, nieces, nephews. You know, so through that time, I've amassed a lot of coping skills and techniques. Yeah, you know, and and uh, this is for anybody listening, watching, this is just and such an insurmountable, is that the right word? I don't even know, amount of grief that one person can possibly take on. How, how did you, take us back to, let's say how you moved through the first loss, even enough just to get back to, not life as usual, I can't imagine it ever would be, but life again, you know, how did you, what was the process then? And then we'll, we'll get to the second, the second big one. Yeah, absolutely. And imagine this now it's been 30 years and with that first loss, I mentioned 30 years ago that there was lack of support. Mm -hmm. Things have changed dramatically in those 30 years. And so both my mom and sister were, were with us at that time, and they were a big support. And I had a couple close friends, but I didn't fully understand the magnitude of my loss with one child and now compounding that. And my, that's been even greater. But I really forged through in doing the things that I knew that kept me healthy and would keep me going. I did return to work and I was able to focus on that. I was able to focus on my health mm -hmm. and staying active and being very mindful that I kept a positive attitude. You know, it's a tough situation to have and lose a child, but to think about it is to have, not have a loss define me, but have it refine me. And having come out of that, even through that first loss. Yes, of course, there was those waves of grief and in, in, in the times that I horribly missed her. But I also knew that I wanted to continue to live my life. It was to leave that in the, in the past and to be able to look towards the future and live in the present for what I did have. So, okay, so it sounds like it was a combination of support, which is crucial, taking care of your health and work. Was work like a sort of a healthy diversion for you? Was it a way to take your mind off it a bit? Yeah, it was a healthy diversion. And I like the way you put that because it can be healthy. It can be unhealthy as well mm -hmm. when you use that to um, deny, avoid acceptance, um, those type of things. But there was also the people that I work with um, knew me throughout my pregnancy and they knew my daughter. So it was <clears throat> a supportive environment in which they helped me. And I was able to focus on something that was productive mm -hmm. rather than wallowing in my pain and grief. And, you know, and I remember, I remember losing my mom and it was so interesting because I really saw how people respond. Some people run right towards, run right towards the, the pain and the challenge and run right towards offering support and other people don't know what to do. So they do nothing. And I remember coming out of that situation saying, you know, I would rather be a bumbling fool and say to someone, I don't know the first thing about what to say to you, but I'm here, than just not showing up. That, that's just what one of the things I took from my own experience. Did you see how people were responding to you and uh, what, what did it look like? Yeah, when it came to that, in part of that, one of the things as a mother, one of the things I really wanted to do is to make sure that I remembered my child and that my um, we spoke about my child. However, her dad did not feel that way. And so there was um, a divergent path in between the two of us. And when he didn't want to speak of her, 
And so when we gathered socially, she, my daughter became that elephant in the room mm. that nobody would want to talk about. And it was treacherous because our friends' friends knew, our friends' family and their children knew about it. You know, even the cousins knew about it. And this even got more difficult after having my other children because my other children at this, at, until later, were unaware that they had an older sister who passed away. So she was the elephant in the room in the home environment, and that was difficult. But when I was outside and at work and with that support, they're the ones that were able to help me and process and speak of her. So it was really two different ways. And, and I found that speaking about her, creating her memories, was so beneficial. I mean, nine months is such a short period of time, but she was with us. And it's just, she deserves to be spoken about much the same as, you know, if we have a grandparent or a parent who passes away in their 80s or 90s, we still talk about them. Of course, of course. So then how, it must have been challenging for you and your husband because you had one way of coping that was so different from from his way. And, and I guess you want to sort of respect each other's needs, but how do you how do you do that and, and move through this type of experience? Yeah, having those were very, very different. And um, we, we, struggled through it. I guess that's the best way to put it is that we just really struggled with how to do that. And to bring to point about that, that elephant in the room. So my sister had made a scrapbook, a photo album of my daughter. And when she finally completed, I'd had my other three children. And I decided that was going to be the tool in which I used to introduce my children to their older daughter, her older sister. And their dad wanted nothing to do with it. And so I just sat down with them, the three of them. My youngest one was very young. So she was only maybe nine months old herself. But the other two were like three and five. And again, young to comprehend that they had had an older sister, but to be able to speak about her. And so I used that to be able to introduce that to them and open that up because now when we were with friends, we were able to talk about Courtney because we didn't have to worry about my kids hearing it or when we at the grandmother's house, their other grandmother's house, wasn't worried about the cousins mentioning her. So it opened up a whole new world in being able to speak. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question and I'm gonna ask you the same question for both experiences just to see if there's a difference. What was the best comment someone said to you and what was the worst? or least helpful comments someone said to you in let's just talk about your daughter for now. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I think that one of the, I'll start with the worst because that's one that just pops up is because she was our first child and for somebody to say, well, you can have more, mm. um, you know, and granted we could, there was no guarantee and but that doesn't justify feeling the heartache and the loss. And the best things were people that were, we're here for you. I love you. And I want to help you. So it's those are the things that I knew that those were the people that were saying that, that I could count on. Yeah. To really just be there. And they were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it's just something as, sim as simple as that. But that's that's one heart talking to another heart. Yeah. And and that's just it. And, and you mentioned earlier about being that bumbling full of not knowing what to say. And I think even if we if you were to say that to me and it's like, I just don't know what to say, but I'm here. Um, I want to be of help. You know, I'm going to stumble over my words here, but I want to to be there. That comes from your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes as as I work with people in in their grief as a grief coach, is that we are so heartbroken 
and that anything said inappropriately, even if from the heart, just strikes a chord mm -hmm. and hurts. But what I encourage those who are grieving is just to step back and really evaluate and say, what was their intention? It was to be helpful and they didn't know what to say, but because child loss, okay? People don't expect to lose a child, right. you know? Right. And we're used to this whole natural order of things that children don't pass away before parents. And so as a society and whole, we struggle with how to deal with that and what to say. It's not something that we're used to happening. So it's, we're not prepared. And when we come across it, then we just, it's born and stumble. And, and speaking of what, not knowing what to say, let's talk about your son now. And, and ha, let's just move through that experience. So I'm sure you were in shock and, you know, how did you, how did you manage that? What'd you do? Yeah, you know, um, Debbie, there's, I had struggled with this for a while and why my grief was so different. My daughter was nine months old and it was an accident. My son was 24 and he took his own life. And so I struggled why it was so different. And then in between even, I've, I've been evaluating why is it different between my parents, my mom, dad, my sister and, and everybody else, but it's, it's, it's unique. It's unique to that experience and unique to that relationship which you have. And so when somebody dies by suicide, that leaves a lot of questions, um, you know, versus somebody who dies in an accident or old age or cancer. So it, it's a, I think it's a different process because we have an added layer of complexity with it yeah. and being yeah. able to understand that why. And so I definitely dove into that and people questioned me and it's like, hey, did you see any signs and symptoms? You know, what happened? How did you not see it, et cetera? And I had no idea. And even, you know, his sister who uh, was close to him, worked with him and uh, some of his roommates had no indication that this was something. And so I think for me, it was helping to understand suicide itself. Me and helping that is that when somebody chooses to take their life, that's a choice. And even though it's a choice, they may not be, or most likely are not in a healthy state of mind. And it can be from a variety of things. It can be um, that pain can be caused by physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain that somebody is experiencing that far exceeds the will to live. Let me rephrase it, that exceeds, it, it causes somebody to want to end that pain so much that the that to live creates even more pain. So in order to dissipate that, they end their life. And so that was a big piece in understanding that, in that it wasn't a selfish act, um, understanding that the things that were haunting him, you know, um, from one of the chaplains that I spent some time with, we talked about this specific thing. And he said that the demons that were sitting on his shoulder are no longer there mm. and that they're gone. And that my son is at peace and at rest, that those things aren't haunting him. And that was a big component in being able to understand that. The other piece was knowing that even though he took his own life is that people have questioned that, you know, why did God not stop him? God has, you know, he allows us free will as well. And he, in those moments, he was next to Connor shouting in his ear, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And so I've been able to lean into that, knowing that Connor made that choice. And then I have my faith as well to be able to do that. It's been, so that mental piece of understanding it, and then I've really dove into going back to losing my daughter is that what things have helped me get through. And that's been staying healthy physically, you know, nutritionally active, um, spiritually active, emotionally and mentally bringing those four things into play 
which have really helped me to do this. And that involves, you know, being able to, you know, accept my loss, mm -hmm. being able to walk through my fears as well. So those are the things that really helped me. And that's what I've been able to put on paper and bring together and realize this is what's done it. This is what's helped me. Yeah. And you're right. There is that added layer of complexity when it comes to suicide. So I imagine if it weren't difficult enough for people to run towards you and offer support, now they for sure don't know what to say. So like I'm, I'm thinking with, with situations that I've had experience with, with uh, families and, and you know, with suicide. And, and again, I am just that bumbling idiot. And I just figure they'll forgive me as long as I just say, I don't know what to tell you. I'm just here. I love you. I, I, whatever. And I'm fumbling and stumbling again. And when we, if we go back to that, do you remember something? Because I, I think this would really serve everybody listening, watching the worst thing someone could say to you. And then again, the best thing. Oh, you know, I think I really think that because it's suicide um, is that when somebody starts to dig a little bit deeper and ask more details. And for me, I think that that is irrelevant mm. and exactly how was it, you know, what method that he used. And I think that that is somebody that's, that their curiosity mm. is taking mm. them further, which I think for me personally is inappropriate um, the fact is, is that he just took his, his, took his life. And the best thing is to know that he loves me and having people saying that he's watching over me. Um, and that goes into a whole different segue because I know that he is, and then he is coming through to me and supporting me. So knowing that and believing and also helping me to say, I will be okay. Mm -hmm. For, when I look back, there's a handful of friends that have been with me through both losses, through those 30 years. Yeah. And they've yeah. been the ones to say, I'll be okay. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and, and I guess it seems so, yeah. I mean, the thought of that probing, that just seems for like gossips. I don't even know why someone would, would, probe. I don't see the value of that. What, how in any way that could possibly help you, but yeah, the, now here's the, this is really interesting that you say that because the, he's with you. That would be one of the first things that would come to mind. Although I kind of hesitate to say that because I feel not everybody is ready, willing, or able to kind of hear that. So it's really interesting because that would be something that I would love people to know. Like I connect with my mom all the time. I know she's around and I even know how she's around, but, yes. but I, how do you know, like I would be hesitant to, to lead with that. Um, but is it, is it better to just do that anyway? It's what I believe, but I kind of wait for a little bit of an opening <laughs> and, then I, and then I go for it. You know, that's, I, for me, that was a struggle as well. Um, as I did this is because I had somebody gift me um, a medium reading. And um, my belief had been that, you know, it's like a seance and, and talking with the devil type of thing. And I researched it. I talked to other friends who are um, involved in being a medium, other Christians, and really made that decision, decided that it isn't mnemonic. And so I've had multiple readings and my son has even popped into readings of other people and they've contacted me and said your son is persistent he's come in this is the message he wants to share um and so that i i believe that i believe that their physical bodies are gone but their their souls and their spirits exist yet that they're with us and he will they say that electrical energy is the easiest thing to manipulate there's uh, some lights in my china buffet that he will turn on yeah. and um, that I will feel him and just feel his presence in knowing and that's very comforting for me as well yeah. and so yeah. that he's he, his his body's gone 
yeah. taught him, but his spirit and his soul still exist. And that's and that's why I so want to share information like that because it is comforting. You know, I remember uh, losing my mom years ago, and I met with John Edward, a very very well known medium. And at the time, this was like right before he was famous, and I was so paranoid meeting with him. And I remember sitting in in the waiting room with my husband. I was so paranoid that I that I'm hiding my mouth because I thought there are cameras on me reading my lips because this way he'll interpret it. And I said, I just want to know she's okay. You know, and, and I get in there and he, but not only did he, it was an hour and a half session and he, he was, it, he mentioned things. There's no way anybody else could have known, but he's just said the first thing is she's okay already. You just stop asking, you know, just <laughs> even the way, uh, the way he said it. And it was just so, I found it so comforting. And that was the moment I said, you know what, just because I don't understand something doesn't mean it's not true. And it opened the doors to so much. So, so Peggy, th- I mean, I knew this would be so eye-opening for so many people. What do you want to make sure everyone knows as we wrap up? Boy, you know what that is that child loss is tough. I admit it. We also need to remember that it is part of death is part of that circle of life. And to be able to remember that it's not the order, it's not our wishes, but it happens. It just happens. And I really think that being open to moving from your grief through that to your healing, that you can can and will come out still being able to live that fulfilling life, experience joy, happiness, and peace. But it's intentional. You know, you it it cannot be done by crawling onto your bed and pulling the blanket over your head. Mm-hmm. It is facing that pain, that difficulty, and intentionally healing. And so people can do that. You really can't. And you're a walking, living, breathing example of someone who did just that. So where do we learn more about you? So anybody who's going through this, has gone through it and feels they're not fully healed can reach out to you for, for more help. Yes. And thank you. And you know, I was talking about some components of a program that I offer. It's a hope and healing after loss program where I bring together those things that I've acquired in a mass over those past 30 years. And so it is about the acceptance and and being able to give yourself permission to heal, but give yourself permission to grieve as well. Knowing that there's fear associated with, understand it, identify it, face it, walk through it, and then focus on those aspects of your health, of your physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health where we bring this all together so you can find some purpose as well and be able to move through this. And I ask people to think about this. It's like, would your child want you or your loved one that you've lost even be wanting you in this state of mind and despair? And I can guarantee that they're going to say no. Think if you reverse those t- the tables. If I were to pass away and my son were to be crawled into a corner, then I would be yelling at him from heaven and saying, no, don't. You, you, we loved each other, but live your life. And so I bring that all together and it helps people to move through their grief to that healing. And so how you reach through me and I offer like a, a teletherapy session a grief breakthrough session. So it's like this. And I I can reach out to anybody and where we talk about what are the steps for you? What's going to be available to you and how we can modify that. So through my website, you can schedule that grief breakthrough session. And the website is the grief uh, specialist. And it's with two E's. And the reason why I say that is because I am the specialist. I've been through this. So it's the grief specialist.com where you can, um, you know, you can get a copy of my book, downloadable copy. You can also schedule that grief breakthrough session and check out the other resources that I have. 
Yeah. So yeah. that is the best way to get in touch with me. Beautiful. And we'll have all of uh, Peggy's resources in the show notes. And um, Peggy, I just, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you for walking through it, not just once, but twice and coming out with so much wisdom uh, to share. And I think the best, we, we really owe it to humanity. If we've gone through something and we, and we've learned a few things to share it. And that's exactly what you're doing. And I'm sure on some level, it gives you a feeling of, uh, you know, of, of joy, knowing that you're helping so many others with uh, what you've been able to heal from and, and walk through and sharing it with those who, who are where you were. So thank you so much uh, for your wisdom and your insight. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. And it's been my honor and my pleasure. And if I've helped one person through this, then I am done my job. Um, you know, so please share this too. I encourage people to share this episode with others who you think might benefit from it. Because this is that tough topic. Mm -hmm. And hearing it in this way gives them an opportunity to really let it sink in. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you loved that episode as much as I did. Peggy is one brave woman. So if you're going through this as well, reach out to her. She can help. You can find her at thegriefspecialist.com and we'll have all of her information in the show notes at thepbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. The worst thing to say to someone who's lost a child, well, you can have more or at least you have more or with suicide, asking anything about the details or method they used, which is completely irrelevant. The best thing to say to someone who's lost a child, we're here for you. I love you. Or if you're like me, Peggy said it's perfectly fine to fumble for your words and just show up. Like the show, be sure to subscribe and please rate and review and share this podcast with whoever might benefit from knowing it. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough. Thank you.